Hello, welcome to the Friday, May 12th, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storms and its Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from San Diego, California. If you're wondering what the rig exploit kit is about, uh, Pratt has a little update here. He's observing it, installing the Ramnet Trojan lately. And now it's your typical infection in that it starts out by visiting a compromised website that then redirects you to the URL that Cisco calls the seamless campaign, which will then attempt to use the exploit kit in order to install the Ramnet Trojan. As usual, Pratt does provide uh, full packet captures of an infected system as well as various indicators of a compromise. His advice is keep your systems patched and you should probably be okay. But well, it doesn't always take malware to have a problematic software on your system. The latest example is software that was found initially on some HP laptops but apparently does also affect a number of other manufacturers. The problem here is an audio driver. And now this audio driver was written by Connexent. Connexent is a company that makes a lot of the audio processing chips that you do find in modern computers. And this driver was developed by Connexent for its hardware. But turns out that this driver does a lot more than just process audio signals. It also records all keystrokes that a user types into a log file in the clear. This log file appears to be available world readable on the system. Now at this point there is no evidence that these logs are being exfiltrated uh, to a remote system. Whenever the user logs in again into this laptop and it's usually laptops where you find uh, these audio drivers, the log is overwritten and started uh, with a new log but still Anybody that has access to the system has access to the log, which of course does contain usernames and passwords. So it could easily be used to escalate privileges, could also be used to pivot to other systems to which the user has access. Overall, the scope is really not quite clear yet uh, from what have I've seen, what some of our handlers have tried on their HP systems. Not all HP laptops do have these connexant drivers, but uh, then again, they have also been spotted with the same key logging uh, feature on non-HP laptops because the software that's really responsible here is not HP software, it's software that were by Connexent, and then again, their audio processors are being used on various manufacturers' laptops. What you should do is check your laptop and you can refer to the link that I'll append in the show notes for possible locations, whether or not you do see this particular log file on your system, whether or not you are running some of the affected Connexent software. According to the author of the blog who originally found this odd behavior, it could very likely be leftover debug functionality because certain keystrokes are supposed to be used to control the audio features and apparently the developer wanted to check uh, which keystrokes cause what codes to be sent and as a result locked all keystrokes to this log file. It appears uh, to be safe to just delete uh, the actual executable that creates the log file. Not sure what kind of functionality you may be losing as a result. And Encase is a company that's uh, very well known for forensics software that it uses to help analyze uh, compromised systems. Now, part of its offering is a free tool, Encase Forensic Imager, that you can use uh, to collect disk images in various formats. Now, one of these formats is LVM2, which is commonly used by Linux systems, but not parsed correctly by Encase case forensic imager, which can actually lead to a malicious code being executed with the rights of the imager, which is typically the user investigating the case. So an attacker could essentially prepare a medium with a malicious partition that will then cause the malicious code to be 
executed on the examiner's workstation. Now, the end case forensic imager will crash whenever that happens. So there is uh, some indication that to the investigator that something bad happened. But aside of this, there is no obvious sign that malicious code got executed. And well then, today we'll actually try something new. I have with me here David Fletcher. David is an STI student and we want to start adding some interviews with STI students to the Friday episodes of this podcast. STI, the Sense Technology Institute, is the accredited graduate school that is a part of Sense. So, David, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you are in your degree absolutely uh, I'm supposed to graduate this summer and I have uh, two presentations to give but I kind of have to work that in with uh, work at Black Hills okay. and uh, teaching for Sands okay <laughs> yeah, it keeps you busy for sure uh, can you tell me a little bit about the work you're doing I'm a pen tester for Black Hills information security before working for Black Hills I worked for the Air Force for 23 years. Uh, the last place that I worked was the Air Force Research Lab in their offensive cyber operations branch. So it's been an interesting adventure. Uh, I started on uh, doing mostly blue team sort of things. And uh, the research lab is always looking for uh, engineers and scientists to work there. And that's how I ended up in the uh, OCO branch. In uh, one of your research papers uh, for STI, uh, you took uh, PowerShell and you looked at uh, vulnerable network protocols. First of all, why PowerShell? Uh, uh, why didn't you use like a tool that's really more geared towards network analysis, like Wireshark or t -Shark? Really, what I wanted to do was find something that uh, I didn't need to install a tool on an end system for. So when we do tests at Black Hills, typically uh, one of the tests that we perform is a pivot test and we're essentially given an internal machine to uh, see where we can get from that uh, target, assuming that malware has been infected or, or has infected that machine. So we kind of have to live off the land. And PowerShell is one of those things that's just ubiquitous in a uh, Windows environment. So it, make it makes it very easy if we've got a PowerShell tool that we can download and run on those target machines. So is this also in part uh, to avoid some whitelisting techniques and such that uh, may flag a tool like... Absolutely, Shark? absolutely. So uh, there are several techniques to bypass PowerShell restrictions, and this should work with pretty much all of them. And it's not going to get flagged like uh, a malware tool or you know Wireshark or T-Shark in a whitelisted environment. Now, I myself see myself always as a blue team or as a defensive guy. Now, uh, with this tool in particular, you're looking at uh, some of these weak uh, network uh, protocols like DHCP and the like. What do you tell actually your defenders? Uh, how would I defend myself against this tool or what lessons learned could I apply uh, to my defense? In posture? many cases, what we see is a lot of the protocols that I'm looking for in the script are things that you shouldn't see from an end host perspective in any case. So things like uh, VRRP and OSPF, that if I can see it, I can potentially abuse it. So what I would really tell those defenders is, hey, you need to trim this at the switch port or stop emitting it from the router and make sure that you're only communicating this information to devices that actually need it. In addition, where things like DHCP has uh, an opportunity for a boot attack, I would recommend, hey, if you're gonna do network booting, segment that off and then put some access control lists in place so that for me to abuse that, I have to be on that network segment with those devices. That way you avoid spreading that information across your entire environment. Now, in your pen tests, uh, where uh, does uh, this technique become really useful? Do you have any more stories uh, where uh, this really helped uh, In out? several engagements, what really piqued me uh, on this particular topic was going through SEC 660. And the first day talks about different types of network attacks. Uh, but on almost every engagement that I'm on, I'll sit and I'll, if I've got the opportunity 
say I've got a Linux box or I've got a machine where I can install Wireshark, I'll listen for five minutes and then take a look at those protocols and identify you know, what might be a problem. Uh, for the most part, uh, what we tend to abuse is link local multicast name resolution and network net BIOS name service. So, you know, they're both multicast uh, name resolution protocols that allow, you know, hosts on a Windows network to route by or, or to resolve names by rumor. Uh, and that's obviously always dangerous because someone on the same segment as them could just plain flat out lie. And when we're in a pivot test, it, it's one of the standard things that we do when we land on that target machine because we know that if we can lie to machines adjacent to us, we can serve them up exploits or we can lie to them and get credentials from those boxes. Now, one of my personal interests, of course, is always IPv6, and I have to throw in a little bit of that here. You mentioned multicast protocols, and that's, of course, what a lot of IPv6 is about, you know, neighbor discovery and also the, the name discovery and such uh, via multicast packets. If you look at all uh, into IPv6... Uh, I, tool? I've gone so far as starting to parse the IPv6 header, uh, but because of uh, the way that the uh, next header fields work, uh, it gets complicated a little bit quickly and i really didn't find a whole lot of packet captures that helped me a lot from an ipv6 perspective so uh be short of testing out the tool on customer environments where i could actually grab traffic that i was interested in parsing and if the traffic isn't out there it's just difficult to to uh to reproduce, and it's also difficult to find edge cases where you know one header precedes another, and you've got to make decisions along those lines. Now, thank you, David, for taking the time here to talk with me about your work. Anything that you're working on right now that we should be looking forward to? I've always got something going on. Uh, what what we're really working on a lot right now is uh, uh, Wild West Hackfest. So we've got a bunch of labs that we're trying to accomplish, both uh, SDR-based type stuff so that we can uh, demonstrate what you can do with a software-defined radio. So hopefully we'll be able to get those together uh, and we'll have a bunch of blog posts on them uh, so that everybody can follow along. This was just the first of a number of similar interviews that I plan to conduct with STI students. I will always append them to the Friday edition of the podcast. Over the weekend, people tend to have a little bit more time to listen to this. If you're interested in any more details about STI, just check sans.edu. You will find David's paper in the research section. That's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.